Alrighty, hello friends, welcome back to episode two of Day-to-Day -day Dev. Uh, so far we've been really good recording ahead of schedule um, because according to the last episode release, they are going up on a Saturday. This wasn't intentional, it just kind of happened like that, so maybe we'll try and stick to that, that kind of regularly, uh, see how it goes. But um, once again, I'm joined here with Steve D of Tinsa Games. Uh, and I am Keith Franks of Cutlass Board Games. We're both Australian board game dev people that have been around a while now at this point. Um, and we kind of wanted to do this podcast to talk about some of the day-to-day -day stuff that we do as game devs to kind of demystify the career. So kicking it off, I, I want to know what you did today, Steve. Uh besides all the day job stuff that i do because i'm not really full time i uh um interviewed someone who might be able to help us out as an intern which is amazing oh, nice. um, where my interns and... at i want interns <laughs> yeah so this was something that i um, <laughs> luckily got through i was i did something with uts mm. um uh presented something um at their local game design event and talk to the people there about what we did and some of them one of them put their hand up and said look you mentioned interns um so yeah that was really good um nice. and i also what else did i do today uh well in preparation for that what i did today was to go through all the things in my cupboard the prototypes and the ideas and the half prototypes and the somewhat play tested things and try to make a list of them um, yeah right Okay. I should be better at organizing them. Um, mm. I should be better at keeping notes on them, <laughs> but I am not. I'm getting. I'm trying to get better every time. Mine's so bad. So I was like going. Yeah, I was going like, oh, where did I leave this at? What was? I know I made some decisions to make it better, but I didn't write down what they were. Um, yeah. So I, the computer game in, industry is very good at teaching people to do version notes. Um, mm. Well, it's very easy to keep notes just as you're doing stuff. Yeah. I have that as well because uh, I'm working on a digital uh, companion to Murders at Tewitt's Manor. And basically in it, I will just put in notes as I'm writing stuff to like denote areas, but also to be like, this this section is supposed to have this thing here. You haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's um, always a good one is to... Uh, yeah. Uh, as soon as you've got an idea, start writing out the, out the rules mm. because then you can always just go, I don't know how this works, but I've got something. Um, mm. Whereas if you've just got a couple of notes in a, in a book or something, or, you know, you, you haven't got anything saved, you haven't got anything dated, you know, da data files on a computer will start doing that for you. And you can just go, you can, you can rough a few things. You can go, this is where we're up to. Well, Google Docs is good for that because uh, it has like an innate version history type thing that you can look at, but yeah. it's like really shareable with other people. So if someone's playtesting or helping you with playtesting, you can share them the document so that they can put down notes from the playtesting or whatever, or you can put those kind of things down or if you're collaborating with other designers and stuff like that. So pretty much all of my games have a Google Doc. But most of the ones that haven't made it to prototype are a Google Doc. That's usually how I'd, I'll do the spec initially. I'll literally start with the components and go, okay, what is in the game? And go from there, uh, which I think, I think helps a lot. Yeah. Mm. Um, I usually sort of try to describe what I see as sort of the core mechanisms because I often start very, very vague. You know, I've got like, thematic. oh, well, I can see this as being not so much thematic. Well, sometimes thematic, yeah, but also like, I want this to be, you know, uh, a two-player game, and it's got deduction, and I, I see it as involving this kind of interchange or something, or, or I want to do, you know, like like, um, it'll be like combining mechanisms. So mm. I'm working on something at the moment that I want to be like a more smaller scale Captain Sonar that's mm -hmm. fully co-op, right? So it's more about people trying to without within. Uh, with incomplete information, move something around a board when they don't know exactly where it is, except one player does, but he can't tell them. That's the brief sort of thing. And then you sort okay. of start from there. Okay. Um, that sounds cool. You can, yeah. Um, you can feel so, my yeah, cogs turning a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 
and, and from there I've worked out a little bit more about what components there might be and stuff. But yeah, I always try to start with a brief, um, and then yeah, components or phases is another way that I often start. I mm. like there have to be this phase where we set things up, and then we'd move on to this, and then this is how we'd probably finish. Um, yeah, uh, Moza to its manner is really good for that because it's kind of um, when you're playing it, it doesn't feel like it because it flows really nicely. But in the writing of it, it goes, okay, there's two parts. The first part is drafting, and the second part is placing things. And so you're like, mm -hmm. this is all the stuff that matters when you're drafting, and this is all the stuff that matters when you're placing things. And organizing it in the rulebook is hard because you're like, well, I, I explain both phases first, and then they occur in a certain order. Like, you obviously have to draft things first. So do I then explain everything in the draft, or do I go, this is enough for you to draft, and then this is enough for you to start playing things, and here's like the extra things you need to worry about or whatever. And then like a lot of those things um, tend to come to mind, but I tend to just write the rule book as if I was playing through it sequentially. And then you get to the end and there's the, oh, here's a thing I forgot. <laughs> here's a rule we added later. And just like the bottom part's an appendix of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Which is not, to... it's not great, but it gets it's, there. It's a start. Mm. Yeah, paint on paint on the canvas right and exactly it later. exactly um, yeah so a lot of times if i if i if i'm not on my computer or something i mean you can google docs is great i used mm. to before that just use email like I'd, I'd have a few friends who i like to show these things to and i just get on and go what about a game about this yeah again, put a time stamp on it <laughs> i can then i'll hang on to it i do that to um, you sometimes but normally it's a tweet it's like yeah. here's a weird tweet idea that i was not brave enough to send i really <laughs> should be doing that with game ideas but i tend to just inbox myself on messenger because it, it does kind of function in the same way and so yeah. i just have like a pseudo to-do list pseudo ideas list of stuff that i keep in there which is pretty good or like the notes app on your phone you can even get google docs on most smartphones pretty easily yeah yeah. Um, so there's a lot of easy tools uh, for that kind of integration. Yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can actually work when you're away from your desk these days, which can be good or bad if you if you want to have an uninterrupted thing. But if you're if you're on a bus or something, I I, I actually do a lot of public transport riding for my work, so mm. um, I'm I'm often going. Uh, yeah, I've got time for my brain to just cycle around. And keep yeah. to keep me from going you'll, mad. You'll see um, something and I'll give you an idea. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, solve a problem while I'm just waiting for a bus or something. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, there's something else that you said there that I was going to talk about, but I don't remember what it was. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. The other, th sometimes, yeah, like Twitter and stuff is um, because we've all got the memories function. Sometimes I'll put an idea into Facebook because I know in a year yeah. it'll show up again. And then yeah. I'll be like, "Did I do anything with that? No. Is it? Do I think I have <laughs> Is any new?" It's still idea good. Today? Yeah, <laughs> um, that can be that can be good. Um, that happened a couple of days ago. An idea came up, and I went, "I think that actually might work." Like I couldn't quite see it then, but I know I'm thinking about it again. Yeah, um, so I'm taking it back to the the table and going to make a prototype and see if it That's does. It's interesting. Work. It's like a weird message in a bottle thing where it's like, mm. "Here's an idea, but I don't have the skills to bring it to realization yet." And then yep. in a year, you're like, "Oh, hang on a minute." I have accidentally encountered the missing piece of this puzzle, and now I can, you know, yeah. go and build the game. Because I had that with one of my very, very first game, Cutlass, hence the name of the company, um, was a really generic deck builder, and it's died and been reborn several times in several different ways. But playing Wingspan was the thing that solved all of the problems that it had. And I know that this yeah. sounds like the stupidest thing ever, but when you <laughs> play the new version of the game, and if you ever play the old version of the game, you can see exactly why Wingspan fixed all of its problems. And sometimes yeah. it's like that. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, one of the ideas that I had for for this old game was, was because I was trying to solve something for a new game. As mm. well. It's like, oh... Your brain, your brain actually, they, they call it incubating or something in psychology. It's the, the ability for your brain to think about things when you don't consciously think about it. Mm. Um, your brain is actually doing work. Um, and that's why you know, riding a bus or driving a car or something can, can help. But your brain that's is doing things when you don't realize it. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, look, I and that's one of the when I, when I do a I have this event that I run sometimes where we try to get people to make a tabletop game in two hours flat, and I always break it up with a, a break in the middle where they play test other people's games because part of that is their brain stops furiously consciously working and when and then we come back for a second round where they get to create again and their brain has rested and, and incubated a little bit mm. and they're like, oh I, I thought of something also uh, other people's because uh, i've actually gotten I, I did this um it was at a library one time i brought my partner along with me and i what you did was you go hey this is the theme we're making a game around this theme here's a bunch of components yeah. and what was interesting was we got to see a whole bunch of other different people engage with the same problem and the problem is you have to create a game with this theme and so some people go okay this is my solution and what i made was incredibly light because i was more interested in uh watching you present the course than actually doing the content and so but um i created something incredibly light as you know part of the course and then uh, in looking at other people's stuff, you go, oh, actually, you did this thing, which is how you engage with the problem, or you did this thing that was an interesting idea, or, you, you know, and then seeing other people's stuff allows you to see how they've solved a problem, so to say. Um, when you come back to your prompts, you're like, oh, actually, this thing that I was missing, uh, like maybe it was an art thing or whatever, and they had found a different colored texture or something out of the bag, you know, and yeah. you can come yeah. back and go, oh, actually, I could fix this with this thing. Um, which I think is really cool. And I think helping other people play test is really good. Like just in general, like play testing events and that kind of stuff is really good for being able to help your brain solve those problems or like looking back at, you know, new games you haven't played yet, especially if it's in your like kind of genre. It's really good for those kind of things. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's a great, it's a simple way to add to the industry and help other people out. Mm. Um but it also is really good for you because you get to play another game to see how somebody's brain works. You get to incubate on your own problems um, or you, and, and yeah, it, it's, it's good. That's something else I did this week was in fact, um, I also do consulting and mm -hmm. I was asked to consult on someone's game. He'd been working on it for a very long, long time and he kind of, as often happens, got a bit lost in it. Um, and had also decided that maybe he was going to change from kick, uh, from kickstarting it to pitching it. So he was like, I need to rethink everything. Because mm. uh, he was sort of working on it, all his promotion is like, how do I sell it to to people? And he's like, now I want to pitch it to a company. Um, and it was not ready for that. So, okay. yeah, um, we had a, a session of an hour or so to just go through how to pitch to companies uh, how to think, how to, what companies are looking for, uh, and also just things that, that his game might need. Um, so that wasn't even a play test. That was just looking at you know, the art, the presentation, the ideas. Mm. So they have a sell sheet? Uh, they don't, but they are making one now. That was the thing. They really yeah. Do. So when they go, hey, I want to pitch my game, you go, where's your sell sheet? And they're like, the what? And you go, okay, step one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's um, cool. And, and here's some examples. And here's a podcast episode or, or something about how yeah. to make a good sell sheet. Because yeah. there's a lot of that on. There you, is. Can, you can type that into YouTube and go, who's got advice for a good sell sheet? Or go on um, your your favorite group and go, show me your sell sheets to give me ideas. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of good, a lot of good you know, Facebook groups and, and discords where you can get advice and get examples. Yeah. Uh, you, have to, you have to know that, that that's a thing. And the first that's time true. you're like, what, what is that? Um, uh, and yeah, that's why just talking to people can be great. Mm, um, networking is important. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it, it, networking makes it sound like you have to be this incredibly, um, uh, connected or, or charismatic person, but a lot of it's just going, Oh, what are you working on? Yeah. Oh yeah. Can you show me? Right. Yeah. Every game designer is like desperate to show their game to other people because that's the end goal, right? Is people will play your game. And yep. when you're interfacing with that person and you're like, hello, I would like to play your game, it, it doesn't require any charisma or <laughs> social skills. Um, I just appear charismatic because I try incredi incredibly, incredibly hard um, to mask just how terribly anxious and terrible I am on the inside. 
<laughs> when in reality, the whole time, I'm so incredibly hyper-vigilant about every single thing. But because I'm mindful of that, I'm seeing it in other people and going, I understand you're anxious about this thing. I've been exactly where you've been. I'm going to ask the questions and do all the things that I wish people had done for me when I was starting out, all this kind of stuff. And it makes it really easy to interface with these people. Because uh, we run uh, Tabletop Tuesday on the last Tuesday of every month, right? Yeah. And recently we had a guy come in that had been a few times but never brought a game. And he was like, oh, you know, I'm a bit anxious about getting in and showing stuff off. I'm like, look, we're excited to play your game. What? Like, No one's going to sit here and just roast you or have a go at you. We're just going to maybe offer some constructive criticism or whatever. And I think the hardest thing that he had from the takeaway was um, how some of the graphics design was done or the fact that he had a board and a box that were not the same size. Um, and then, like, that's a great stepping stone to get started on what's, you know, the next thing to do. And I think interfacing with other people is really only going to be positive like regardless of whether it's specifically um uh, product focused like feedback on a game or whatever this might be a person that has a skill that you're missing or whatever like that so and a lot of the vibe is always just we're hanging out with other people that want to play games so it's a lot more yeah. like a regular board game session than a work meeting or a business event um so i think it's it's really not that it's really not that stressful or maybe I'm less stressed because I've done it a few times. It, it's certainly, I can feel, like, even though I've done it a lot, sometimes when I'm bringing a new prototype to a big social event, I'm like, oh, you know, you know it's going to hit hit tension and some things are going to break, so that yeah. can be quite nerve-wracking. But as you say, people are there who are keen to play games. They love games. They're already on your side. There's people who are who have been in your position, so they're keen to offer positive feedback. Um, and the feedback, if the ne if it's negative, it's it's designed to make your game better mm. uh, as well. So you know, it's 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 still on your side. And um, I think I think it's really important just to see things being played and through the eyes of others. Like there are certain art forms, like sketching and drawing and painting. Mm. You can look at a tree and you can learn how to draw a tree and you can get it perfect and go, yes, that is exactly the painting I wanted without talking to anybody else. But there's other art forms, um, like like acting, that you pretty much have to do with someone else in the room, mm. right? Because you're bouncing off that other person. And comedy's like this as well. Stand-up comedy, you have to have an audience to know what works and what doesn't, mm. and, and to get feedback. And game design is the same. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, I think that's actually a really interesting point, right? Because I think the audience here is something that's going to be very different for each piece in particular, yep. right? With with the canvas, and you paint on the canvas, the audience is trying to determine what you are trying to communicate in this piece. In a piece of game design, where you literally are writing a recipe on how to fucking interpret and use the thing that you've created, the audience is expecting a different kind of a handshake from you. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, and games are, as you say, they're instruction manuals, mm. really. So in that case, you really have to be um, figuring out you know, how people use your tools. Um, can, they, can they make sense of them? Can they use them? Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and because it's so practical like that, because it's um, all about... Um, usability then there really is a um it really is important to, to get it into someone's hands and go what do you think this means what do you see this being able to be do and things like that um, mm. and uh yeah i think i think and and finally it helps you see your game as something that is sort of an external has an external physical meaning because um when it's sort of an idea it just sort of looks like it's words on a page it's cards that you might cut out it's only when they're actually like people take them into their hand and go oh this card is good this card is bad i want to play this card that changes how you see yeah. it in your own, in your own yeah. brain um and that is going to help you go oh it is a game i can go back and work on that Mm. Um, so it's a really good I mean that this thing that's talked about all the time is it's good to get your 
uh, game prototyped as fast as you possibly can so that you can see it being played. Well, it failed um, faster, I think, is the, yeah, yeah. the convention I hear a lot um, these days. But I think it's interesting because yeah. in, um, in the different forms, right? So if we go back to stand-up comedy and acting... Yeah. I think there's an interesting thing where people are associate that performance with you very closely because you are that experience or you are that character forever. In board game design, when you put the thing on the table and the other person picks up the cards, that person is interfacing with something that is not you. And so when they're criticizing that thing, it's not a criticism of you ever. Whereas a lot of times when an actor's performance gets a criticism, it's leveled at them particularly, even though oftentimes it's the writer or the director or something that was the issue. Yeah. Um, and it's really easy for someone to go, this thing sucked. And you go, well, I can change that. I can fix that easily, you know. Uh, unless yeah. if it's been published already and it's been bought off the shelf somewhere, then you're like, well, yeah, it's too late for feedback now. But um, yeah. well, it's, a, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, you're not... You know, if you're a comedian standing on a stage, there's nothing to hide behind mm. um, when they boo you. But if you're, if you, if you're, and you hear this a lot, people say, "Oh, it's just a prototype, right?" That's your, that's your cover. It's like, um, uh, you know, that's oh, just a prototype. Um, it's early days, you know, and it's like, yeah, let, um, I'm expecting it to fail, and um, you all know that it's a prototype, and it's yeah, it's not, it's not part of me. It's just something that I've, I'm i'm working on mm. um i guess that's also really hard when you're a star though is because you don't know how good you are you know if you have any skills at all and you end up attaching a lot to a product yeah trying um, to figure out if you deserve to be more than a hobby designer um i think yeah. is a scary leap and i i think it's probably like what i imagine a lot of people struggle with in that kind it's like sort of like imposter syndrome even people that have got like real stuff published and real stuff done it's like oh am i ever really more than a hobby creator yeah. um which is probably in that same kind of category um i think it's why i tell people one of, something that's really important is to make a lot of games um if you can like try not to do the i've spent 10 years of my life on game x because you're not learning as much um, following that one thing mm. and it also means you're really attached to it um, whereas if you've made a couple of games um, especially some shorter ones or something you go well how does this work does it work okay okay well now I'll go back to my larger one with some of that knowledge um, there's lots of reasons to do it but the one reason is yeah attachment like if you've just made your one little baby then everything is hooked up to that mm. whereas if you've made you know 20 something games in the last year you know you, you, you're okay with one of them like going oh this one absolutely sucks but that's okay i know how to make another game i've got some yeah. other games um, something in this might become a lesson for later in one of the other games that i create yeah yeah mm. um, i mean that's yeah that's something that was um i've seen a lot of game designers sort of go this is my baby i've spent you know x years on it and i want to get it out yeah. it's that's that's good it, it can and it can be published but it can also be a bit of a trap mm. uh, because you get stuck on that one game and uh, that's why i do things like you know making a game in one hour and things like that or two hours because it helps you go oh i've made a game um and it's in my in my in my box now it exists um, yeah that's right and um i've learned some things you also get to finish if you work on something small you take it all the way up to finishing mm -hmm. which helps you learn how to finish instead of learning just how to start and tinker just forever yeah 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 so i mean when i first started working on rpgs i had this big massive idea for a game about dragons that was going to just be you know it would have been this massive sprawling thing with a really complicated system and then one night i was just like watching predator and i went oh i should make a role-playing game about predator and i it in a day and it was just it was very freeing and mm. um, it helps you get out of that little rut mm. um, and you know then you can you can use those skills going forward um, so yeah try to and, and also the other thing is if you are making a game and trying to take it to publication um, if you're in, ever in a position like as you said before everything you the other but also if you're 
pitching, you might be sitting next to a guy who goes, look, you know, I love your game about dragons. It's pretty good. But what we really need now is a game about Predator or whatever. Mm. You know? And you're like, shit, I just did one of those, right? You, you, <laughs> yeah. Thing that you, you, if you've got a few more things in your briefcase, um, then every step of the way you can go, ah, but I do have that or I do have something like that. Um, mm. Or something that can be rethemed to match yeah, what they're trying yeah, to do. Because right. often publishers will have an IP um, that they're trying to satisfy with a game. Um, or they're looking for a category of game. I see a lot of uh, publishers mm. that go, hey, this is what we're trying to fill our slate with. It's four games. The first game is of this complexity, this play count. And the next game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're like, well, hang on. I have something that fits in maybe one of these categories, um, yeah. which I think is also interesting. Yeah, um, that's very often the case. And that's another reason to sort of make it different games. If you've got a game that is you know, only two players and someone puts out a call for, you know, we need a, we, we're looking for our, our, our roster doesn't have, you know, a solo game. You're like, oh, well, you know, or whatever. Um, it's good to have variety. And that, that is really common. Um, you know, game companies are aware of, you know, game trends like anything. And one thing they're often interested in is, do we have things in our category in our in our catalog that appeal to different types of people? So have mm. we got a two player game? Have we got a five player game? Have we got a solo game? Have we got you know a more complicated game or a lighter game? Um, as well as fitting into their vibe, um, you know they yeah. also want. You know, sometimes they're like, oh, we don't have a roll and write. Every other company has a roll and write or something like that. We saw a call out for that just a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Um, and uh, um, yes, yeah, so they're like, we need uh, we need a roll and write, or you know, they're shifting into something like that. So um, yeah, um, so if you can try to make different, and that's also a great. If you've never made a game like X, it can be really hard, especially when you find you find a niche. You find like, hey, I'm really good at making games, like that, right? Uh, you know, um, I tend to be good at party games. Keith's really good at social deduction, and it's like, thank God I'm good at something. And you keep doing that over and over again. But then every now and then, it's worth going. Well, I don't have. I've never designed a game for one person, or never designed mm. a game that's more complex than this. I'm gonna try it, just because the, the 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 bit of your brain that can get a little bit comfortable actually will benefit from going. Whoa, that's really hard. Mm. Um, and and the stretching is good for the brain muscle so um yeah think about setting yourself a challenge sometimes these challenges can be really stupid like this like make a game with you know has no components or something and you can just be tying yourself up in knots trying yeah to just trying to um keep the sword sharp like i was um in the in the office right where we do tabletop tuesday and i was there a bit early and on the whiteboard, there's two markers, one green and one red, and six magnets, four blue and two pink. And I was like, yeah. there's a game here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I, you know, I went and filmed a whole video of me building this weird, like, map making kind of a game. But I think it's funny to have um, a lot of really good fundamental skills where you can go, okay, how do I put this together or how do I build this thing? And then seeing something that maybe you think will help challenge yourself. So, okay, I'm going to try and build. Like, I recently I did a tile laying game. I'd never done a tile laying game before. I took it and play tested it, uh, and it was bad. It's not that the game was bad. Um, like, I didn't have a rule book or anything written up. I just had, like, a really generic idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and the players didn't interpret the objective correctly. Mm -hmm. And what I had created was basically a... Uh, it was kind of a race, but rather than doing something quickly, it was like you had to have the mathematical least number of mistakes. And I won by like one step because I had mathematically the least number of mistakes. Uh, and the other players were like, I don't understand how you did that. Uh, and then like when we, we walked through how the entire thing worked, it was like, oh, I made this one minor weird shape thing with my tiles. And that meant that I wasn't able to quite get there in time or I made this weird uh, economy choice. And it was like... Mm, it's really not the game I was trying to make, <laughs> like really at all. Um, but like, there's a lesson in that. 
And yeah. if I went to come back to that, I now know exactly how this weird thing went that I could lean into or, you know, lean away from. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's always useful. Like, um, uh, to, to just, to just even try even if you don't get anywhere, you know, think about something, see how it goes, make some notes. Um, it can be like if you've never made a game and you're sort of frustrated, it doesn't feel like much. But if you if you are doing some of these other things where you're you're taking games along and you're designing them, it's perfectly fine to just go, okay, what would I do if I was given X or Y or Z? Mm. Um, and you know, Keith does lots of these on his on his channel. Like, how would I make you know um, a faction for this or a faction for that? Um, mm. I did that recently. I was playing Root because it came out on Steam. I I'm I'm playing and I have my yeah I'm playing with my partner on Discord I'm I'm streaming it uh, to her so that she can watch what I'm doing but just hanging out right and I'm like man it would be so cool if I could make a faction for one of these games this would be sick and she's like why don't you I'm like let's fu that's like a great video idea I'll <laughs> go and do this exact thing and so I was like okay so not only am I making YouTube content which I'm just so fucking content brained about lately but also I'm scratching a particular design problem where I'm able to go, okay, how can I create something that fits into this existing game? And Root is really good for that because it's asymmetrical. And yep. it has a really good existing dynamic uh, with, with the marquee and the Woodland Alliance. And they've built other things that fit around that, right? And then you go, okay, how does something exist where it doesn't overlap with any of these things because that would make it not asymmetric? But is able to interact with them and be balanced and not be broken and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think I did an okay job, but it was like one of those really interesting design challenges where it was like, could I do something like this? Um, I, I really enjoyed. It. I had a lot of fun doing. Yeah. I think stuff um, like that is not a bad idea. Yeah. Anytime you've got a game with a faction or or a, or a part of it, so. One of the first things I did when I was really into un Unfair, right? Mm. Unfair's got these sort of modules. I designed a, a, a module. So I went through and figured out what was in each each module set, what needed to be there, an approximate, like tried to eyeball the, the, the approximate you know values of things. Mm -hmm. um, Spirit Island, that's another game I love. Um, okay. So I was like, Spirit Island, there's all these amazing spirits. I was like, oh, okay, I want to make a spirit about this. Um and then you know you can put it online and people are like whoa that's super broken and i'm like oh okay uh -oh. tell me why and you <laughs> yeah. learn more about the game um, yeah and uh, also what people come to expect um because they've already played that product right when you create a prototype yeah. no one's played your game before so when they're playing your game they're both figuring it out and trying to decide if it's fun or what works and what doesn't work. So they're both strategically identifying it as well as like learning to play on this kind of stuff. When you create content for an existing game and you go, here's the existing thing and people go, that's busted. You go, oh, you probably do actually know how to play Root or you do know how to play Spirit Island. You have mm -hmm. a bit more of a weighted opinion on whether or not something would fit or would not fit. Um, and so like making stuff like uh, cards from Magic the Gathering or cards from Marvel Snap or whatever, when you make these kind of custom cards for these like really existing games, and you go, this is something that needs to fit in this you know slot, and people go, okay, it makes sense. Nothing exists like this before, and I can understand how it would function, but maybe it's overcosted, or maybe it's in the wrong color, or maybe you know what I mean, um, yeah. which gives yeah. you really easy guidelines on how to fix something that they've identified, um, which I think is really more specific and helpful feedback sometimes. <laughs> yeah yeah um well it's more about it's more about a sort of a, a very specific dive into the economy of that specific game and the designs mm. of that specific game and that actually is a skill that's sort of more about development than design which is also a good skill to have um not only being able to find new spaces for new factions and things like that and understanding how factions work but also being able to sort of drill down and go what is the exact economy here mm. um and and learning that and getting that into your head so that you can um you can develop um and yeah game developing is a 
it's not necessarily an entirely separate skill, but but there are some players, there are some people out there who are way better developers than they are designers. Um, they're great at taking you know your sort of core game and and you know adding factions and adding value and making it into a complete project. Um, mm. And some people just end up doing that as their 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 whole you know career. Um, their 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 natural developers or their best at developers. And um, last week we talked about wearing different hats. So if you um, if you can't get a job as a tending you. I think you um, just cut out a little bit there. Oh, sorry. I was saying, if you can't get a job as a developer, or until you get a job as a developer, you can pretend you're one. Mm. As well as designing a new game, you can go, okay, well, fine. how would I develop the um, Apparently, that's something they do in a lot of um, uh, schools now, right? If you're mm. learning to do game design, they give you a game and go build an expansion for the game. Oh, that's, that's cool. Something new. That's interesting. Um, for yeah. a lot of those big existing games, like Carcassonne and stuff like that, um i feel like that would be a really interesting not like a challenge but like project because yeah. you'll have a, um carcassonne specifically you have a lot of stuff that you can measure against um a lot yep. of existing yep. expansions as well as a solid base game um that's not too complicated and you can see how complicated the expansions are to yep. figure out exactly what you need to put together so i think that's actually a pretty cool um cool way to test your stuff without necessarily creating an entire product fresh yeah yeah and the other thing you could also think about is what if um not so much an expansion but like a reskin or something like you know mm. when they made star trek Catan, mm. they actually changed some of the rules or something or you know there's a lot of games these days that are sort of second editions or rethinks and stuff and it's like okay so what if you know this game that's about making a theme park is now about you know making movies right mm. so it's still got it's still got characters and it's still got sort of sets but how would you change the mechanics or something you know okay yeah um, that's interesting that's another good exercise i mean that's something when we used to as i say we've done these events where we get people to go make a game about this theme mm. or make a game using these mechanics um years ago we did the we sort of did uh, we got a bunch of old games out of a thrift store and we got like monopoly and trivial pursuit and a few other things and was just like these are your components make a new game and mm. um that's just another way to sort of rethink things and, um so much of this as we're saying is conceptual right like it's seeing things in a different way and if you're going oh okay you know people turned the, the pieces of pie in in the old trivial pursuit into like a pick up and deliver game where you're picking up these little pieces and bring them around the spaceship and cool. um that's just another way to think about. Oh, look, that's yeah, that's what this could also represent. Mm. Um, and uh, we get very locked in very easily sometimes about well, the only way to represent that in a game is with with those things. And then you go, well, it doesn't have to be that. It could be something else. Mm. Um, and that may again give you some ideas. It's all about stretching your brain. Um, there's actually you know people say things like. It's a bit of a cliche, but if you turn yourself upside down and look at stand, um, they're all they won't all help, but sometimes something like that, just going, how do I see this differently, um, can just trigger something. So if you're blocked, you know, um, and that's why playtesting is really there. It's really good because you're getting three or four other people's point of view mm. uh, which just you might just never have thought of and that's just like oh right instead of having to find a way to turn my brain upside down brain. someone else will offer to do it for you <laughs> that's right that's right so we kind of covered a lot of professional development type stuff because i feel like we do as designers spend a lot of time doing that but was there anything else in your kind of day to day that you've done today or recently, uh, I talked to um, yesterday. I had a, a conversation with the people running the new South by Southwest, actually, mm. um, which is coming to Sydney um, in a very, very big way. Okay, that's um, exciting. So, this yeah, is my first um, hearing of it, also. <laughs> yeah, so South by Southwest, if you don't know, we started as like a, a weird music and then film festival in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. um, back in like 1980, I think it started. And it is now one of the premier film release and computer game release events in the world. 
um, and they've decided they want to franchise it and they pick Sydney, it's going to run from the 15th to the 22nd of October, and okay. they're taking over just huge parts of the city. Um, and there's like four branches to it, like music, film, games, and technology, I think are the four. So there will be a, just a ton of stuff on. Um, okay, and shit. they're at the moment figuring out exactly how much of, you know, what what all that looks like. Um, uh, so we're having some preliminary conversations about what the tabletop thing will look like and not sure exactly yet. Um, Sign me up, homie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's a good, it's, I think it's, <laughs> after COVID, a lot of people, like some, some conventions died in COVID, mm. uh, definitely. But I think after there's a general thing at the moment where people, people are very big on conventions. Mm. Um, it's becoming the new way to sell and to get people excited about things. It's, it's still the easiest way to fund a Kickstarter. Yeah. By a yep. great margin. Um, and... So we've got a new con starting in May uh, in, in the Gold Coast called Tabletop Con. Mm. Uh, there was a, uh, something that happened in, was it in Melbourne or in Sydney this, like, in this month as well, April? There was a new gaming con that was sort of like... Oh, you mean TGX? Yeah. That, yeah, was, that was March? Yeah, I think it was March. And it was sort of, um... they wanted to do it like six months <laughs> off season with packs for computer games mostly yeah so um, the tgx is one that i went to um and it was really really new and there was only really one other tabletop board game um there right. but it was very digital and i do think that there's space for there to be more and and grow into more but it is nice to see that we're getting um more of a convention scene it would be nice if it was a lot more in sydney because everything feels like it's in melbourne yeah, yeah. Um, those are both in Melbourne, Conquest in Melbourne. Um, mm-hmm. So this will definitely top things up in Sydney mm. um, because it could be, um, it is, I think, uh, it's the first year, but I think they're really wanting to put it as something like um, this is a reason for people in other countries to mm, True. So, so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, um, it is, and look, you know, um, they're a great way to bring products to to to, to customers. Mm. Um, it used to be hard to get people to come out to a convention, for certainly for tabletop gaming, uh, because there just wasn't a lot of local stuff, and everyone would just order their the, the uh, foreign stuff online. Yeah, why would I go to a convention when everything that they have is literally something that I can buy at my local good games? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a complaint that I have a lot. Because I, I really think that there needs to be a lot more indie stuff for these kind of things. Because to me, it's an expo and not a retail yeah. convention. Um, and the way that these uh, conventions, primarily packs, run on profit is by it being a retail convention. Uh, and you can kind of see that with Supernova, where it, it has no other thing. It is yeah. just a shop, basically. Um, and that's really unfortunate for indie people to get in and really do anything uh, worthwhile in my opinion because if you're not like when you're there you're like i have to be selling things i have to be on i have to be doing this and you lose a lot of the other things that are useful about conventions like yeah. networking or um showing just showing off a prototype because you're like why would i bring something that i'm not selling right now to get feedback on if i'm not monetizing my time yeah so yeah i think it's i think it's really hard to do to make a good convention that satisfies more than those sort of things and and in america it sort of makes a lot more sense because people often live in sort of smaller satellite towns at least before the Mm. internet too you would only you would go to these things because then it was the chance to get things you couldn't get at home yeah but now with the internet and australia we often live in big cities anyway yeah where's Um, the where's the the big convention that just has all the stock of shit that we can't get because amazon doesn't really ship here very well (laughs) like yeah well Surely if someone you... has had this idea and has made a mistake somewhere and has missed out because that just seems like the most easiest solution to a huge problem that we have. <laughs> like, if if shipping <sighs> prices keep going up, we might have something like that where the only reason it's worth it's like worth bringing in like a couple of everything for a convention once mm. you go trying to stock stores. So yeah, we exactly. might see a return to something like that. Um, yeah. So. Um, 
things are changing. People are more conventions are starting up, um, mm, which is exciting. Yeah, and it's a it is live. That's excitement. Um, unedited highlights <laughs> of people knocking on my door. <laughs> it um, happens, but sorry, right, we'll move yep. on. Yes. Uh, well, the other thing I also did this waiting for printers. Hmm. Uh, so maybe that's what we could actually do talk a lot more about that next time but um definitely I mean, because yeah. i've i've got a lot to say about it because when you post that you're doing a kickstarter every printer rep and their dog sends you a message yep so i've got a very convenient list of literally every single manufacturing facility in china sitting in my inbox and i already have one <laughs> yeah yeah i, I saw it you um, <laughs> Uh, it's like, and and when you're going to Kickstarter, you already have a a, a publish a printer in mind. You know, yeah, you've not already lined up and signed contracts. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's maybe something. Yeah, we'll we'll um we'll flag that for next week. Tune in next Definitely. time, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll talk uh, about so about printing, finding a printer, and the the, the vagarities of, of of working with printers. Um, yeah, the moment we've at that point where we've done all the work and we're just waiting for, go you know, okay, here it's done. Um, mm. Here's a, here's your prototype, uh, but it it sort of goes into a black box and you then you find out. But yeah, let's um, let's talk about that next time. Yeah. Um, so we do have a little bit of time left, um, yep. and kind of running off the back of some of this stuff. So I guess what I really did today, what I really did today was mostly video editing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. But I also had a call with Jason, a homie, uh, who's a graphics designer because he's doing a bunch of graphics design work for me. Um, and so most of my day has just been like organizing things rather mm. than yep. um, specifically doing. I it's like not it's like more management than networking, but it's still talking to external people to solve problems. That's right. Um, yeah. Which I think is interesting because I've I've been blanked on this one particular thing for a long time. Um, so to launch a Kickstarter campaign, you can't have any incomplete Kickstarter campaigns. And some companies get around this by having multiple accounts because they're scumbags. But I had a particular thing from my Winning Love by Daylight campaign that hadn't been completed yet, and it's an art book. And the reason why it hadn't been completed yet was because I was expecting to have other things happen between now and wh when the campaign had ended two years ago. Um, and I would release the art book as the last thing and be like, this is a campaign ended. Here's the next thing. Unfortunately, the next thing is now, much later. Yeah. And dragging my feet on it for so long has been really hard to do. And I was like, I know a guy. <laughs> So I was like, I'll get Jason to come on. He can do all the graphic design. He can just fucking make the whole art book. I don't have to stress about it. And then it's done. I can tick it off my to-do list and submit it. And then that basically, like that update of the, hey, everything's done. Look, we're finalized. This is the, the future of this product. Um, there isn't one. Sorry. <laughs> here's, the, here's the art book that we promised. Also, here's the next project because uh, we're going back to focusing on board games. Because for a time in COVID, it did actually look like Cutlass Board Games was going to head in a more digital direction yeah. um, because everything was just shut down and it was really hard and we didn't really know if it was ever going to open again. But Murders of Two Worlds Manor happened both digitally and physically. Um, we're kind of, I guess, hedging our bets, really. Mm. And yeah. now we're back. And this episode is going to come out the day before we go live on Kickstarter. Oh, exciting. All right. So tomorrow, when, you know, after you've just watched this, um, Motors of Suez Manor will be live on Kickstarter. Um, I will be happy, and it will be funding, or I will be stressed, and it will be funding. So, <laughs> um, so definitely go and check that out. That's what I've been working on recently. But it's um, mostly looking at um, graphs. I spent a lot of time recently yeah. looking at graphs, which is like uh, I bring up the Kickstarter demographics um, data all the time because uh, that's how I, I craft my marketing audiences. I'm just like, literally, okay, what is <laughs> who is on Kickstarter and how do I target them? Um, and then I'm looking at like my ad ad returns, like cost per clicks and stuff like that, um, click through rates and all this kind of stuff. 
Uh, I look at my YouTube analytics maybe 20 times a day. They don't change that much after the first time you look each day, <laughs> but I still check it every time I open up my internet browser. Um, but a lot of that stuff is really interesting because if you follow some of it closely, like it's got some really nice different segments of the, the data that you can look at. Like the, the one that I like at the moment is the last 48 hours. And you'll see some content in that brick, right? So your last 48 hours should be stuff you just made recently. And then there's this one video, June 9th or 10th, 2022, that keeps showing up. And that is because I made a really good video about Blood on the Clock Tower, about how to make balanced setups of the base game Trouble Brewing. And apparently yep. that continues to get a lot of traffic to this day. It's one of the most successful videos on this channel. And it, it pops up all you know, the time. Yeah. Like stuff and, yeah. Um, uh, and like some of that's going to be like, there's obviously reasons why that's a good video. It, Mm. introductory it's about a really popular game but some of this is also random you don't know which one to catch on yeah well where that hole is in the market that people are looking for a thing because yeah. i think a lot of blood on the clock tower content is aimed at players and less so at game runners and this thing in particular i was like here's like a really generic thing also i just happen to know a lot of shit about blood on the clock tower because i put over a thousand hours into this game um so i'm like okay here's a guy that does actually know stuff but is also just not affiliated with the company so i would just if something is bad i would just happily say look just don't use this or don't do this thing um giving a really unbiased opinion on what things are good how things are going to work what you should do and i think some people have like related to that really well or whatever but i think it's interesting going back and looking at the analytics because uh for example i made so Marvel Snap has been a, a good cash cow for me recently when it comes to getting views. Um, I recently made something that I didn't really put a lot of effort into, but it had a kind of a unique concept. Um, and it hit 4,000 views, which puts it in my top five. Right. And I was like, wow, shit, how do I replicate this? So I made a video afterwards. I replicated the thumbnail. I did all the same stuff, used the same kind of thing. It did terribly. I was like, okay. You know, what did I do wrong? Well, then I tried to make fresh and new. I spent like two hours on this thumbnail because I did like a whole bunch of Photoshop work. I, I had to edit out a character's arms to make it look like they're holding a shark and stuff like this. So I was like, it's like so not in my wheelhouse. It was like really hard and I'm like putting all this time into it. And then the video does terribly. I think to this day it has 15 views. And I'm like, how do I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like sitting here trying to learn what parts, like uh, what things have done well, what parts of my analytics are trying to tell me, what is this data trying to tell me, what is my advertising stuff trying to tell me, you know what I mean? Because you might just set up an ad and you go, well, this is just the Kickstarter demographic data, but I don't know what part of that is a successful bit. Is it the age range that's really hitting good? Maybe if I change the age range, would it be hitting better because I'm missing a part or whatever? Um, so I'm always just looking at the numbers and hoping it tells me something. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's all. I don't nearly get into it that much with details, and um, I definitely could do a lot more. But I think all of us are looking at numbers at some level and, and trying to figure out as much as we possibly can about mm. where to advertise and mm. who our audience is and what they want. You know, we we want to make the games that speak to us, but we also want to figure out how do we sell it to you? Who wants this more? yeah um, where is the market for this product i can't sell yeah. it if no one is interested in it <laughs> that's right yeah where are, where's the market where are those people what sort of things do they do mm. we're having a conversation today about whether we want to make it yeah so that, you cut out in exactly the one yeah. key part of that sentence <laughs> so the score we launched that it's a card game we're yeah. talking about whether we want to make a digital oh, okay it works in the yeah, browser. yeah. So that people can just load it up on their phones or whatever and, and play it that way and so that the question is do do people want that you mm. know? the game is um, light enough you could in theory make a pretty sleek app but also yeah. you could just make a nice steam game because yeah. steam game adaptations of board games are killing it lately mm. uh wingspan is fucking amazing yeah. root really is nice. a thousand times more fun to play on steam than it is in person i'm very sorry to say <laughs> um there's just so many complicated things about that game that the app makes so much easier you don't have to remember um we got calico coming soon that i'm definitely going to be picking up when that comes in so i'm always just like looking for that that mid-weight board game 
that has just slightly enough complicated like uh, complicated stuff to it where being simplified on the app is going to make the game experience so much more fun. But I think that because the score is light, it means that on you, the integration is not that complicated, but it will hit a whole different audience uh, that you would not have connected to before that yeah. maybe want to buy a physical copy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's something we're looking into, um, but it does depend on us, yeah, figuring out how to put something on Steam and how to find people on Steam and... and... How to build it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, so I'll be having some conversations about that, but also, uh, as you say, looking at, um, you know, the people who buy our games and going, do they go to Steam? Um, obviously there's new markets there, but also like, um, yeah, uh, how do we, how do we connect? How do we find those? How do we transfer mm. all those kind of things? Um, especially cause it's not, I, I assume a market you've interacted with before. Cause I don't think you have any digital digital adaptations do you no we we've got lots of stuff on on um tabletop simulator okay anything on and bga no because bga is yet. really good too you basically yeah. um ask them yeah, politely we'll that, and they do it all a, for you oh well, that's good the thing about bga though is it sort of it skews towards a bit more you know more tactical board games and stuff and we've got mm. rpg so true now the score that is, is true the score is between the is sort of a card game, mm. but I can see people on PGA just going, well, this isn't my kind of jam. Because you would have to communicate to the other person. They mostly just have a text chat function, so I don't know if that would be correct, but there's been a murder, I think, would mm. work really well on this, because for the most part, you can't communicate, except for that one person that gets the... It's like drunk, or it was monkey or something? It, it, it became gossip, yeah. Gossip in the end, and just flooding the chat with, okay, guys, here's the thing, here's everything I know. <laughs> Um, yeah. which I think would be interesting. So um, maybe try and get on to them with that because it's definitely that. something interesting worth looking into. Yeah. Um, I'll see if BGA is interested, yeah. Mm. Um, all right, well. Um, we are at our time. In the future, yeah. And next time we want to be talking about printers and manufacturers because yep. I've got takes. I do. Excellent. I've got some hot takes ready to go. So if you're interested in hearing about what happens after you've prototyped something and you're trying to get it built, trying to get a manufacturer, trying to figure out how people are going to buy something you haven't handmade, you need a manufacturer, and maybe yep. you need to listen to the next episode of Day-to-Day -day Dev when it comes out, hopefully the Saturday after this one. <laughs> Sounds exciting. Um, so... To stick around for that, make sure you hit that subscribe button. So, because look, I yep. post a lot of crap. Okay, there's a lot of Marvel Snap, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon content. I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter, so there's going to be a lot of stuff around that. So, if you want to see it, you got to hit that button. Otherwise, this particular podcast might not show up. But it will be in a playlist. So, if you want to bookmark the playlist, it will be automatically generated with the new episodes when they come out. So, get on to all of that stuff and. For next time, I am Keith Franks of Cutlass Board Games, and this was Steve D of Tin Star Games, and hopefully we'll be here next time with some more cool stuff to demystify the career of being a game dev. That's right. See you then.